Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another video in the video series Extension 3 Mathematics. In this video, I want to talk to you about the definition, the formal definition, in fact, of a limit of a sequence of complex numbers. And just to prep you up, I want to give you a fake argument, which is the type of argument that Euler uh, might give. And this type of argument shows how you have to be careful when playing around with the notion of limit. Okay, so here we're going to look at this infinite sum. Okay, I've written it as sigma, sigma for sum, and it's just one plus three plus three squared, and so forth. Okay, so you're just adding up powers of this geometric series. And of course, hopefully you should know that this is something that you shouldn't be doing. Okay, but let's play around and work with it anyway. Okay, so uh, suppose you can write this. Okay, I've just written this expression, I've called it sigma, and I'm going to multiply it by 3. So what's 3 sigma? Well, 3 times 1 is 3. Uh, 3 times 3 is 3 squared. And now what I can do is, um, or rather not, what I will do is I'm going to subtract this second one from this one. Okay. And so that's going to give me sigma minus uh, 3 sigma, so that's minus 2 sigma. And what does minus 2 sigma equal? Well, all these later terms will get cancelled, so you just have 1. And now this is a very simple equation, and we know how to solve that. We just divide by minus 2 to show that sigma is equal to negative half. Now, of course, you're probably saying, well, this is ridiculous. Okay, how can it be that when you add 1 plus 3 plus 3 squared and so forth, uh, that sum is going to equal minus half? And, of course, the flaw in the argument is that this sum here doesn't converge to any complex number. Okay, so that's an argument I wanted to show you so that you can see that you have to be careful about playing around with just the infinite sums like this. Okay, but perhaps what is also interesting is that... Uh, this is the only flaw that's involved. So if we're not thinking of this expression as an expression of complex numbers, so if you go to more wilder mathematical concoctions, um, and they include things like something called the three attic numbers, okay, and you consider this expression as uh, these strange three attic numbers, then this will converge, and then this becomes a legitimate argument. And so, in that case, whenever this actually converges, if you have any environment where you can interpret this as converging, uh, what it will converge to is what should be minus half. Okay, so that's some, a rather interesting fact. Okay, so let's uh, go on to now ask the question. Okay, suppose you're given a sequence of complex numbers, sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, and so forth. Okay, what does it mean for this sequence to converge to a limit? Okay, so I want to give you an answer for that. So hopefully you've got a bit of an intuitive sense for what it means to look at a limit of a sequence. And now I want to give you the formal definition. And this is something that is uh, that often uh, trips up and is difficult for uh, university students. And so I want to go through that slowly. Okay, so the notation we'll use, hopefully you've seen this notation before. Uh, uh, so what I want to define for you is the notion, what does it mean to write the limit as n goes to infinity of sigma n equals l. Another way to, uh, to write that is using the following notation. You write this sequence, sigma n goes to l as n goes to infinity. What does that mean? Okay, what do, uh, does that mean? Okay, so I guess the way to motivate it is to uh, basically look at this uh, sequence of numbers graphically. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to look at the uh, indices down below, 0, 1, 2, as a discrete time parameter. And that's going to be across like this, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. And then I'm going to plot these values, sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, as the y value, sigma 1, sig sigma 0 rather, sigma 1, sigma 2. And suppose it's something like that. So in this case here, you can see that y values, okay, the way I've drawn it, it looks like it's approaching some sort of a limit L. Okay, so that's the type of picture that you should have in your mind when you're thinking of uh, this situation where the limit of some sequence sigma n is equal to L. Okay, that's the picture. So how do you give a formal definition of what's going on? Okay, and as I said, I want to think of this axis as a time parameter. 
So let's see what's going on. So basically, as you move forward in time, okay, these y values, they're getting closer and closer to this L. They don't have to touch L, they might, but uh, they don't have to touch L. And what you want is, as time goes by, these y values of these sigmas, okay, they get closer and closer to L, and basically, um, you can get as close to L as you like without touching it, as long as you wait long enough, okay? And not only do you get uh, as close to L as you like, okay, you stay as close to L as you like, um, as long as you wait long enough. Okay, so that's one informal way of describing what's uh, the limit, okay? And what we want to do is we want to turn that informal uh, idea into something that's mathematically rigorous, that's rigorous enough for you to do proofs involving limits. Okay, so let me show you how that goes. Okay, so you want to say you can get as close to, and in fact stay as close to L as you like, okay, without touching it. So if you want to get as close to, how do you want to uh, quantify that? Well, let's say uh, we pick a level how close you are to it. So that's going to be some epsilon, which is um, at least zero. Okay, so you want to say you want to be within a small amount from this uh, uh, L. Okay, so let's uh, sort of like draw that. And what I'm going to do here is I want to pick a level of closeness, which is epsilon, and I want to be within epsilon of this L. So that means the y value has to be between, well, it can go all the way down to L minus epsilon, and it can go up to L plus epsilon. Okay. I mean, what you want to say is basically that to get within this, well, you will get inside this strip. You will get within epsilon of L as long as you wait long enough. So what does it mean you wait long enough? That means there is some time, okay, there is some time that you can pick here. Let's say it's a time in epsilon. So it will depend on epsilon such that after that time, all the values of these sigmas, these y values of these dots, will stay in this strip within epsilon of L. Okay. So you just have to be able to say, oh, suppose I want to get uh, as close to L as uh, this. So in other words, within epsilon L. And epsilon can be as small as you like, as long as it doesn't equal zero. Okay, as small as you like. You will stay within that strip, okay, within epsilon as long as, well, you wait long enough, so there is some point in time in epsilon, which depends on this epsilon, okay? Uh, so you can stay within that strip. Of course, if you make epsilon smaller, you may have to wait longer, so this number in epsilon might change. Okay, so let's write down that definition, okay? So what, that, what does that mean? So if you wait long enough, so if you, uh, if you pick this epsilon, then you can find this wait time in epsilon, such that after this wait time, so let's write down what that means. So after this, so there's some wait time in epsilon, which is just some real number, such that um, if n is bigger than this epsilon, so after this wait time, then this sigma n is within epsilon of L. So that means that if you look at the difference between sigma n and L, that's less than epsilon. Okay? And this is now actually a formal definition for what it means for the limit of sigma n to equal L. Okay? It means that given any epsilon greater than zero, okay, a level of closeness you want to get to the limit, okay, you can find this wait time n epsilon such that if you wait that long, okay, so for n greater than this wait time in epsilon, so if you go far enough out in the sequence, in other words, okay, all those sequence values, sigma n, will be within epsilon of L in the sense that the difference between these two, the absolute value of that, or the modulus of this, if we're, if we're looking at uh, complex numbers, is going to be less than epsilon. And that now is your formal definition of a limit. Okay, so let's just uh, generalize uh, this definition a little bit more. The types of limits we want to look at here involve sums, okay, infinite sums. 
Uh, hopefully you can guess what this means. Okay, so suppose now we have an infinite sum. Uh, it's going to be the sum of complex numbers a, j. Okay, we say that this converges to the limit, and we'll write then in that case uh, what you expect. Uh, if that limit is L, we'll just write uh, the sum from j equals 0 of a, j is equals L. So what does that mean? Okay, so that means, well, what you would do is you look at the partial sums. Okay, so you look at the sum of the first n plus 1 term, say. Okay, so uh, this will depend on n. So this is a sequence of numbers uh, as n gets larger and larger. If this goes to L as n goes to infinity. Okay, so this is quite a different definition probably from the definitions you've seen um, in your other mathematics classes. And so let's give an example to see how this actually works. Okay, and um, the example that I want to give is of course uh, something similar to what you see here but in the situation where this argument does actually work and you actually have convergence. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to look at the sum of this geometric progression, 1 plus 1 third plus 1, one 3 squared plus so forth, this infinite sum here, sigma. And hopefully you know that this is equal to 3 on 2, okay, it's, um, it's the inverse of uh, 1 minus the common ratio, a third, so 1 minus a third is 2 thirds, the reciprocal of that is 3 on 2. Okay, so let's show using the formal definition that the sum sigma of this geometric progression, uh, 1 plus 1 third plus 1 and 3 squared, all the way up, is equal to the expected value 3 on 2. So if you use the formal definition, we need to have pick a level of closeness, epsilon, which is uh, strictly positive. And uh, we need to look at the sequence of partial sums. So let's sigma n equals 1 plus 1 third plus all the way up to 1 or 3 on n. And this sequence of partial sums should tend to the expected value of the limit 3 on 2 as n goes to off to infinity. So let's calculate first this uh, sum of this finite geometric progression. So that's 1 minus the next term, 1 on 3 to the n plus 1, on 1 minus the common ratio. 1 minus common ratio here is 2 thirds. It's in the denominator, so that's 3 on 2 times this numerator, 1 minus 1 on 3 to the n plus 1. Now we want to show that this is within epsilon of the limit value 3 on 2. Okay, so that's this condition here. Um, as long as n is big enough, so you've gone after some wait time. And this is the, basically the key to sh showing these formal proofs is to find this n epsilon. You have to find an n epsilon which works. Okay, so let's have a look at this difference here and see how for all values of sigma n, how close are you to this uh, limit 3 on 2. So sigma n minus 3 on 2 is equal to, we're subtracting that. Okay, so you've just got a 3 on 2 on this 1 on 3 to the n plus 1 left there. So that's an absolute value of 3 on 2, 1 on 3, n plus 1. And that equals half times 1 on 3 to the n. Okay, so we want to find, okay, we just need to find this n epsilon. And I guess what's usually a good thing to do is to try to solve or find a, a good understanding of the set of solutions to this inequality. If you understand this inequality well, then hopefully you can find this n epsilon. Okay. So that's what we're going to do now here. And of course, we usually when you solve inequalities, uh, you do it by solving the equality first. Okay. So first solve. Uh, now first solve. Um, this equality, sigma n minus 3 on 2, uh, which is half times 1 on 3 to the n, equals epsilon. So if you solve that, what do you get? So I guess you double both sides and then you invert. 3 to the n is equal to uh, 1 on 2 epsilon. And to, uh, to extract the n, you just take log in base 3. 
By the way, here, note that epsilon is not equal to zero, so you're allowed to write this expression. Okay, so this is a very uh, important part of the definition, okay? We don't allow epsilon equal to zero, of course, because in the definition of a limit, we're not requiring that this sequence of values eventually gets, hits the limit, okay? It might, okay? But it need not, okay? So epsilon, uh, you can invert uh, because epsilon is not zero. So now uh, this implies that n is equal to log in base 3 of this. So this is a reciprocal. You can pull that out. Negative log in base 3 of 2 epsilon. OK, so that's telling you when this equality holds, of course, uh, for n a real number, or basically, um, so we're solving this part of the equation here, okay? So um, this solution might not exist if you're looking at integers, okay? But if you want to solve this as real numbers, this is what's going on. Now, if you take any bigger real number than this uh, value here, okay? If you increase n from this value here, if you have that value, of course, you get epsilon, okay? But if you get anything that's bigger than that, the denominator gets bigger, so this fraction gets smaller, so you get less than epsilon. So this you can take to be the wait time. So therefore, you can take n epsilon equal to the negative log n base 3 of 2 epsilon. This proves. And so we've checked the condition in the definition of the limit. For any positive epsilon, We've found this wait time such that if you wait that long, n is greater than that n epsilon, you are within epsilon of the given limit 3 on 2. So that proves that um, sigma is equal to 3 on 2. So that's how you do this type of question. And as I said, the key thing that you want to do here, okay, when you're doing this type of thing, is slightly different from the usual type of calculations you might do in other questions. Basically, what you're trying to do is you're just showing that for every epsilon, you can find this wait time n epsilon. And usually it involves some solving and some playing around with that to get your answer.